Hello, and thank you for joining us here on The Neutral Zone. I am Phil Milani, joined as always by my trusty sidekick, my partner in crime. Really, the best way to describe this person is my everything. It's at Eric Dalala. Phil, good to see you virtually. Yes, once again, virtually. Where are you? Where are you right now? Uh, this is where I come to write. There's, I don't like any other senses around, so I just... Uh, turn the lights on some gray curtains, nothing to distract me. And I just grind out content into the void. Exactly. Yeah, yes. That's good. Well, we've got a great episode of the neutral zone in store for NZ nation here today. Of course, we're talking about the quarterback competition. We've seen uh, seven days of uh, competitive practices out there. We're going to talk about maybe ha have any of our opinions changed some of the thoughts that we had entering into camp about Teddy Bridgewater and Drew Locke, has anything changed? I like that. Some, some stuff has changed, I think. I think so. I think so. And then uh, maybe we'll get into what do we still need to see before we're 100% locked into one guy? You know what? You know, the Broncos are practicing with the Vikings next week. What do we need to see during that week of practices uh, to just sort of say, okay, I think this is going to be the guy. Or or do we need to see more than that? We'll, we'll get into that. Uh, we'll be joined by the great Peter King from NBC Sports. Uh, he stopped by Broncos camp the other day, and uh, we had a chance to catch up a little bit. I asked him, Eric, I said, if this team gets good quarterback play, do you think that they'll be in the playoffs? So I asked him that. Did he answer you? He did. He did. So, yeah. Make sure you listen to that interview. Uh, we also talked about, uh, you know, what uh, he, he brought it up on his own. Peter King did, but uh, he asked George Payton, like, what was your thought process on the first night of the draft? Like uh, you went with Pat Sertan, uh, but there was a Justin Fields was on the clock. He kind of talked about that a little bit too. So pretty good interview there with uh, Peter King. And then uh, we'll move on and talk about who've been the biggest surprises so far during camp. A couple of names come to mind, uh, Eric, that uh, have really stuck out. Yeah, that's right. Does it, Jerry Judy probably doesn't count as a surprise. Maybe how good Jerry Judy's been. I mean, <laughs> him yeah. himself has not been a surprise, but like just how good he's been, maybe a little bit of a surprise to some people. I don't know. Yeah. And Eric, we'll wrap things up with uh, a look at the Hall of Fame, what the weekend is going to be like. Both uh, you and me will be out there uh, this weekend and uh, getting to celebrate Steve Atwater, John Lynch, and Peyton Manning. Uh, should be a really special weekend in Canton, and we'll just uh, talk about what we're most looking forward to this weekend. Yeah, I like that. I'm excited. So we should probably be talking for the next, like, three to four hours. So buckle up. I've got that uh... – planned out here scheduled out got the calendar blocked off yeah the whole day devoted just to this and if you're listening that's probably going to be like maybe like four or five commutes all all right here on this on this episode so hopefully uh you stay tuned here eric let's just dump jump right into our first topic here you know what have you thought about these two quarterbacks through seven days yeah i mean well, which guy do you want to start with? Or do you want to start with an overall yeah. view of? Well, I think you could just say, like, what what have we seen from both of these guys? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that they're, it's clear, talking to Vic, talking to Pat Shermer, that they don't think that there's been enough separation yet to make a decision. Both guys have had good days. Both guys have had some not so good days. Um but most days, Phil, it's been pretty close to a wash. You know, they're accomplishing about the same things. They've got the same number of touchdowns, same number of interceptions. So the margin here is not super big necessarily between Drew Locke and Teddy Bridgewater. Um, Just tell me what you what tell me what's on your mind. <laughs> no, I mean that's that, that's what we've we've seen out here. I think that the things that have stood out to me about each guy are different, though. You know, when you talk about Drew Locke we talked about, Hey, he's got to be able to avoid that game, ch that game changing mistake. And for the most part, he's, he's been able to do that. You know, he threw an interception uh, at the end of practice on Wednesday to Justin Simmons. That was probably one of the first kind of 
bad decisions that he's made. And you're going to live with interceptions that, you know, the route isn't quite right or um, the ball slips or you, you just, the throw isn't perfect. Those are going to happen. Those happen to everybody. It's kind of the, the decision-making interceptions that you want to bring down close to zero. And, and Drew had done that for the most part in training camp, called himself a calculated gunslinger. So I have seen him take a step forward in that area. Um, I do think it's also fair to say he's played a little bit safer in training camp. You know, he's taken these check downs. He hasn't tried to force things. Um, when things have kind of broken down in the pocket, he's scrambled. And so it'll be interesting to see, do those things carry over to a preseason game? Can those habits that he's starting to develop, can they, will they stay there when he feels like he's got to make a play out on the field? Um, he's obviously still got that arm talent. You, you know, you, you've seen him make some throws that Teddy just can't make. I mean, that's, that's the pure and simple truth of it. And, and you want more of those compared to obviously the mistakes. And we, we've heard Vic Fangio say there's some sort of equation there of how many big plays do you need to offset the mistakes. But Drew spent most of camp kind of taking the, the safer route, the guaranteed throws. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if that changes in, tr in uh, the preseason. Whereas with Teddy, Phil, I've been surprised, and I think this is maybe my biggest surprise of camp at all. I've been surprised with how much he's pushed the ball down the field. You know, uh, it's not the 50-yard bombs necessarily that we see from Locke to K.J. Hamler, for example, or Locke to Cortland Sutton. It's more of a put the ball up there and let the guy run underneath it and make a big play. But Teddy's, I think it was the other day, maybe Wednesday, Teddy had like three throws of at least 25 yards of his, he only threw 10 to 15 passes and three of those were for 20 plus yards. I mean, that's a, that's a good sign to me. And if he's got a high completion percentage while also being able to make those intermediate throws or, or semi deep throws to me, that's really encouraging in terms of what he could do for your offense. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, I've been really surprised with how fast Teddy's just come in and really picked up the offense. He really seems like he's in command when he's out there. Uh, obviously, he's a veteran, but, you know, this is his uh, first time with the Broncos. He has some familiarity with uh, Shermer from his Minnesota days there, but not too much. And he's really just come in and picked up things. And I'll say this, when I see Teddy out there, things just seem a little bit cleaner, a little bit crisper, like the guy going in motion seems to be a little bit crisper. Uh, the snap seems to be executed a little bit better. Just like some of those little things that go along with the quarterback position seem to just be running a little bit more smooth when Teddy's out there. Um, as far as Drew. You sound like a Drew Locke hater. Well, I'm not a hater, Eric. I'm just observing. Okay. That's what the YouTube, the, the commenters you down below. You are a Drew Locke hater. We know this. No, no. Yeah. I just let you have your little soliloquy here. So yeah, I'm going to just, true. I'm going to talk Keep for the going. next 25 Keep minutes. So. Keep going. <laughs> I think that with Drew, Pat Shermer says that this is the best Drew Locke has ever looked to him. You know, this is the best version of Drew he's seen. I'll say this though. Sometimes it still appears at like when they're in seven on seven, he's not quite sure where to go with the ball immediately. And to me, I'm not sure if that's him being like, I need to go through my progressions or whatever, but a, a lot more times versus when Teddy's in there, Drew is holding onto the ball and then ultimately just sort of running over to the sideline with it. And uh, I don't think that, I think that's just sort of a frustrating for everybody. You know, the, the wide receivers want the ball thrown, given a chance to make a play. And I think that this defense wants to be like challenged a little bit. But uh, sometimes when Drew's out there, for whatever reason, he's just not taking a chance. So um, that has been interesting to me. I thought that maybe the way that Drew was talking, heading into camp, like, hey, I've put in all this work. I've done all these things. On Wednesday, he was saying that he was learning parts of the offense that he didn't even know like, like existed before. I think, is that what, I think that's what he said, you know. So I think that I was expecting the way he had been kind of hyping up his offseason work. I thought he was going to come out there and sort of light it up, to be honest. But haven't quite seen that. I agree with you, though. He's been a lot more calculated with the ball. Hasn't really taken those chances. 
couple of times he's gone downfield, but for the most part, it's just been sort of check downs to the running back, maybe, you know, something to the tight end over the middle where Teddy has been, you know, maybe 10, 15 yards. He knows where he wants to go with the ball right away. Yeah. Some of his balls are floaters, but they're catchable balls to guys who are in position and he throws them with so much anticipation that he doesn't really need to zip them in there. So, uh, when I hit, when I was initially heading into camp, I thought that this was going to be Drew's job that he was either going to lose or Teddy was going to come in and take it. Now I'm sort of thinking like this thing is a lot more heated than I thought it was. Like this is what I've seen from the first day. I would say there hasn't been a ton of separation, but maybe Teddy is ahead right now. Whereas I thought, okay, this was going to be Drew's job to lose and Teddy was going to have to do something to come in here and take it. He's made up that ground and then maybe is a little bit ahead right now in, in the Phil Milani book. Well, it's almost as if someone said going into training camp that they thought Teddy Bridgewater would probably win the job. You are a hater. <laughs> I, I want to go back to your point about how they throw the ball because that's something else that has surprised me with Teddy is that you know Jerry was it it was Jerry right who described it as he throws floaters yep but he's he's made some throws like on third down or fourth down where he's had to zip it in there and he's he's fired it in there so he has the ability especially within like 10 to 15 yards he has the ability to get that ball into tight windows I think he's an NFL quarterback I mean he of course yeah well yeah but like there was a play the other day where Judy's coming across the field and Alexander Johnson is, is screaming across the field too. And Judy or uh, Bridgewater fired it in there and was able to get the completion. And if, if you float it in there, it's getting picked off. And then he, he knew what to do in that situation. I think that's maybe some of his experience showing itself. Whereas I do think with Drew, we've still seen a few throws where you need to take the heat off and it just hasn't been taken off. There was a, a screen pass to a running back the other day that just it almost took our cameraman's head off phil it was uh it was it was flying and then there was a deep ball down the field that maybe you want to loft up there and it was again kind of just on a, a straight trajectory those are kind of the little things that i i think have to improve um you, you talked about drew drew coming out and kind of running away with it or making big plays to me the longer that this i would agree with you i think if I had to, if I had to make a decision today, Teddy Bridgewater is the the guy that I think I would go with. Um, in part because if he's based on what we've seen in practice, and you mentioned this, he's actually pushing the ball down the field more than Drew on a consistent basis. He's completing more passes. I would say, like you mentioned, the offense generally operates more smoothly with him in there. And if the thing Drew can kind of hang his hat on is those big plays. But if Teddy's also, if he's making more of those big plays and he's completing these a bunch of passes, you know, I would guess Teddy's completion percentage, Phil, is somewhere in the 70s or 80s during training camp. I mean, he's just been super efficient. And so it, if you take that and combine it with the big plays, well, then it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense what, I don't know what Drew at that point does better that you would lean toward him now that doesn't mean it, it can't change but at least right now every day that's kind of close I think is another check in in Teddy's column just because he's demonstrated you know he can get the ball to Jerry Judy in space he can get the ball to Cortland Sutton in space he's going to complete all these passes you're going to get little gains at a time and, and that's what's going to make this offense successful and, and the more I watch Teddy out there in particular the more I see hey this team can win games with this guy yeah uh, I mean, like if you're scoring this like a, a a boxing fight, like I don't think anybody's like delivered any major blows to the other guy, but just the over the course of all these rounds, it's been close. But Teddy's maybe just had the edge a little bit more more than Drew has over these days. Eric, let's kind of get into our next topic here: is what do we still need to see before we feel comfortable making a decision? And I think that you kind of hit it hit it there where you were just mentioning, you know, this team can win games with Teddy at quarterback. Do you feel like um, 
all the other circumstances surrounding the Broncos right now. The fact that this defense should be really, really good. The fact that the, the rest of the offensive roster is pretty loaded with weapons. The offensive line looks to be pretty solid that, you know, just considering everything that the fact that uh, this coaching staff is heading into its third year here uh, with a new GM, you know, it's, it's time to win some games now, uh, essentially. Do you think that all of those things sort of point more toward Teddy than Drew? Yes, I do, because I think that Teddy is the quarterback that gives you the best chance to win. And right now, it's less about, hey, can we find a way to develop Drew long term? And it's more about we've got to win. But I, I also think for, for people who might think we haven't given Drew a chance to show what he can do, my response to that would be he got those five games in 2019 that were kind of just they were bonus games. I don't really count those, Phil. Then you get a you get a season last year. You don't. What, well, you I would count that? them, but but the 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 nuance is the season was already a wash. The, the no. pressure to like really succeed wasn't on him then. But let, let me clarify. I don't mean they don't count in terms of his progress. I mean more like if there's a clock on every young quarterback until you decide you've got to move on. I don't think the clock started in 2019. I think oh. that that was just a little bit of experience for Drew and it was like a benefit, but I don't think, cause they went into the 2020 season being like Drew's our guy. And that's so, what I was going to say. Those five games really kind of uh, built some momentum for him is what I thought, you know, like there was like, people were pretty excited about Drew. Right. But it was in no way, a, it was in no way a negative. I don't think no, in terms no, of no negatives, the evaluation me. you then go into 2020. He doesn't have an off season, an in-person off season. That's a bummer. That, that is, a real bummer and we, we are never going to know kind of if he had had that going into year one or if you maintain the off same offensive system or whatever so many different paths that you can take but we don't know what would have happened but the, the truth is is that Drew didn't play great for much of the year and then he kind of turned it on a little bit late in the season still had some turnover issues but played better over the final five games and then you went into year three and this is kind of like the the make or break year it feels like for Drew Locke we've We've talked about that time and time again. And so in my mind, he had to come into training camp and kind of have taken that step. You know, you, you needed to see that he was significantly better or significantly further ahead in what he could do from not from this time last year, but from the end of last season. And I, I just think what we've seen so far, he's, he might be, better than the end of last season but I think it's still relatively close in terms of the things we're seeing and so if you're the coaching staff or you're the the front office and you're evaluating that and you say hey this is what we're seeing from Drew is close to what we saw at the end of last season and again that's that's me saying that but to me that that then goes to your point Phil where okay maybe he hasn't taken this big step and Teddy's the right guy and like, uh, as far as what I still need to see just before I, uh, a decision is made, I think that one thing, and this is sort of in defense of Drew, is that when you're out of practice, it's a controlled environment. You know, like uh, each period they're working on something specific, the plays are all scripted, and he's also going against a pretty good defense out there uh, when you're talking about the Broncos' first team defense. So, um, what I still need to see and when I think that we'll actually see some separation is these games, you know, whether, whether it's a, it's a week of practice against the Vikings and then facing them in a game situation where you're trying to move the ball, you're trying to score, you're, all, all you're doing is essentially trying to go play good quarterback. Then we're going to see it out there. And I think that, uh, you know, if, if uh, Drew can go out there and, and turn it on and, and play really well and, you know, make some exciting plays and, you know, uh, uh, scramble around a little bit, then I think that we're going to still have this competition moving forward and we'll have to see what happens against the Seahawks a week later. But if Teddy goes out there and continues what we've seen in practice and really is able to lead a couple of scoring drives or whatnot, then I think that, that might be enough to just say, okay, I think that we're more comfortable right now with Teddy. 
Yeah, I, I agree that I want to see a game before, and I don't even know if I need to see multiple games. I'm, I'm pretty close, Phil, to being comfortable with moving forward in that direction and kind of saying, hey, let's get ready for the Giants. Let's get behind this one guy and let's go. But I do think one game at least just to kind of see them operate the system in a game environment. Yep. You know, we, we see them come out and um, an incompletion isn't a big deal. But, hey, if you have an incompletion and you get stuffed on second down and all of a sudden it's third and ten, you know, can Teddy Bridgewater get them out of that situation? Or is a, is a third and long mean an automatic punt for this offense? Because we know at times that, that Drew's been able to get you out of that situation. And so can Teddy do the same thing? Can he uh, be efficient in the red zone when you get down there? Because that's something Carolina struggled with. And, you know, I would say through the first few practices, the Broncos offense has not been great in the red zone. So I'd like to see maybe a little bit of work down there if they can get down there. Um, what else? The, the one other thing, I don't know if you're going to get to see this in the preseason, probably not because of how much you play. But the one thing I would be will be interested in when the season arrives is we know Drew Locke, if you fall behind by 10 points or 17 points or 21 points, he's got the arm, he's got the aggressiveness, he can get you back in the game. What happens if you, you know, you have a quick turnover and you, you fall behind 10 nothing? Is Teddy Bridgewater going to be able to, to bring you back? And I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not saying he can't do it. I'm just saying I haven't seen it in this system. And so it would be interesting if somehow in preseason you saw how he operated with a, with a deficit or, or got that. But in all likelihood, that's something we won't find out until the regular season gets here. Yeah, I mean, I don't need to, I don't need to see that. I mean, I think that if Teddy is the guy, you're, you're not going to be falling behind 21 nothing. Otherwise, the mistakes have happened. Something wrong has taken place, and that's sort well, of the, not the reason why Teddy's that, a quarterback. But that happens to every team. At some point in the season, something weird happens. You know, a kickoff gets returned for a touchdown, and then you, you know, have a quick three and out, and they score, and you're down 14 points. I mean, that happens to everybody. Well, that I think to the he can definitely – he can get out of that situation. I mean, I've you've seen him take the shots in, in – uh, you know, in uh, practice and you've seen Teddy play in the league for a long time. I mean, yeah, he's I'm, been I'm able just, to do these type of things. Yeah. So, I mean, you just said you needed to see it in a game because it's not a controlled environment. I think well, it's the same. That's what, that's what I sort of want to just see them, how they operate out, out in a, in a non-controlled environment. Like, I just want to see, I just want to see like Teddy go out there and do what he's done in practice and do it in a game. And then I'll say, okay, this guy, this guy clearly is the, is the guy. So I don't know. It's going to be interesting uh, uh, just to see how things uh, play out in a, in a really competitive situation. But uh, I'm like you, Eric, I think that uh, Teddy has been better than I thought that he was going to be. And quite frankly, this is the reason why you brought in Teddy was to create this competitive environment and see if he's the guy that he has been at times in his career. I mean, he was really good in Minnesota, made the pro bowl, uh, his numbers weren't like insane, but like they won a lot of games that season, his second, his second season in the, in the NFL. And then, you know, by all accounts, when he was on a really good roster in New Orleans and had to fill in for Drew Brees, he did a really good job there, you know, and last year in Carolina, maybe he didn't have all the weapons, you know, Christian McCaffrey was injured there. Uh, he was only there for one season you know, maybe with a more talented roster, he's going to be able to do some things here. Yeah, here's what I would say. If if Drew is better than he's ever been, and we can, I think, I trust my eyes and I also trust the coaching staff when they've said that, that this is the best version of Drew they've oh, seen. I agree with that too, yeah. If this is the best version of Drew that we've seen and Teddy is better than that, then that means that you should have a pretty successful team. I mean, a couple of years ago, Drew went four and one down the stretch, obviously a lot of close games. And then he, you know, things did not go their way record wise, but you'd like to th last year, but you'd like to think that w with Drew, if you think that his previous level of play was about, you know, just below 500 football and Teddy is better than that, at least from what I've seen on the field so far, then, it, you know, you figure, Hey, maybe that means that this team can be, better than 500 can challenge for the playoffs with Teddy Bridgewater. And so to me, if Teddy wins, it's not an indictment on Drew because Drew hasn't gotten any 
any worse. You know, he's improving too. It just means that the, the quarterback play from Teddy is at a higher level. And then you just, you have to go with that because at this point, Phil, I think it's like you mentioned, it's about winning the guys in the locker room. You've got to take advantage of some of these rookie contracts, but you also guys are tired of losing. You've got to give them the best chance to win. And if, you know, it, it, they'll see through it if you don't do what's best for the team. So I'll be interested to see how things progress. If I were to, if I were to guess, Phil, and this is just kind of speculation here, I would think they'd have Drew Locke start against the Vikings just because I think that there's kind of this deference to the fact that he's been here. Mm -hmm. And then I would think Teddy would get the start against the Seahawks. And in my mind, I, I would think you go from that Teddy start against the Seahawks and just kind of ride with him the rest of the way. Now that's not necessarily how I would do things. If I were, I would just, I think at this point I would start Teddy against the Vikings and say, Hey, you know, let's see what we've got with him. And if, if it's something we like, we just ride. But I, I do think in the, in the sake of fairness, they'll probably still have each guy start a game. And I, I actually, I would do that because I want to see uh, Teddy out there with the Broncos ones against the Seahawks ones, you know, and just have that environment. Uh, I, I would do that. I would do both. I would let Drew start this one and then Teddy start that one and then make a decision. And I think that the approach to the third preseason game against the Rams, I would say, I want my starter then, and I'd have him play the whole first half. And then, and then I would, then I'd feel pretty comfortable with the amount of reps heading into week one. I would say, okay, that was enough there, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, mean, if you, if you think back, back to 2016, I believe the order that it went was Mark Sanchez started the second, the first one, Trevor Simeon started the second one, and then they just kind of rode with Trevor from that point. If I remember properly, I think that's how it went. And so I could see a similar situation this year. Yeah, I, I kind of remember uh, Sanchez sort of having a rough outing where it was like uh, multiple turnovers and it was sort of the writing was on the wall after that. You know, there wasn't really much of a decision that needed to be made. But yeah, I, it'll be interesting. It's not like Teddy is way ahead of Drew in my book, but he's just done like enough out there to make it seem like you're a little bit, you feel a little bit more comfortable with, uh, with him out there. And especially this roster is designed to try and win some games right now. The defense should be really good. And in my book, you're no longer saying, okay, maybe three or four years from now, Drew is going to be our, our guy for sure. So let's let him just develop a little bit. I don't think that they're in that place anymore. So, you know, this is Vic's third year here in Denver. There's a new general manager. There's pressure here to win now. And, you know, I would say through seven, day, seven days of training camp, Teddy is a little bit ahead right now, but ultimately let's see what they do in games. And that's going to be able to determine uh, who, who the guy's going to be. So it's by no means a slam dunk done, done deal now. I think Drew could still go out there, light it up in the game and, and give them something to really think about. But I would say Teddy is slightly ahead. Feel like that's fair? Yeah. No, I don't think it's over, but I think it's it's leaning. And, yeah. uh, you know, you've seen, I think something else worth noting is you've seen a lot of the veterans <clears throat> on this roster kind of, we've seen Teddy form a bond with these guys and um, spend a lot of time with them off the practice field. Not that Drew doesn't have that, but yeah, it's, it's been Drew. nice to see. There was kind of some questions or, but th you know, there's, there's always questions about when you don't have a quarterback, how do you lead? And I think Teddy, both of the guys, but since Teddy's new, it's more noticeable. I think both guys have done a nice job of connecting with teammates. And uh, I, I think the offense is going to get behind whoever ends up being the guy. Yeah. And, and I will say at least uh, when they're out on prac on the practice field and, when they meet the media, both Drew and Teddy seem to be great teammates together. You know, like they, they haven't like really had any, uh, you know, spite or anything against the, the other guy. They, they all appear to be very supportive, at least from what I've seen. So that can be pretty hard when you're talking about jobs on the line. So those, those guys have been really professional in my mind. My um, next, my next question, Phil, because I always look forward is, if Teddy wins this job and you go, I'm just interested what 
happens after this year. Like say Teddy's pretty good and you make the playoffs as a wild card or something. I'm very interested what happens next. You well, know, you know, is he the you know how football guys' minds are? They're saying we're always looking to get better. And yeah. if there's an option that gives us that opportunity to get better at any position, they're gonna explore it. That's that's yeah. the football line. So you know how that goes. So Anyway, that's our that's our uh, opinions on the quarterback situation as it stands right now on this Thursday, uh, as we, uh, you know, have gone through seven days of practices. I think that's I think we're both on the same page of where things stand, what what could take place over the next week or so, and uh, when we'll ultimately get a decision here on on what's going to happen with the quarterback. So let's move on. The what? We're haters. I'm trying not to be a hater. This is a pretty objective observation of what's taking place. That's what I'd say. That's what I'd say. So let the comments rain down, though, Eric. I mean, yeah. it's, it does seem like some fans, without being at practice, have formed opinions. And that that's always <laughs> interesting, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's why I say let's see what happens in a game because everybody can watch and see what happens for themselves. And then they yeah. they'll know. So let's just if you're like, in this if you're in this market at least. Yeah, or you find some sort of illegal streaming something somewhere. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's what real that's what that's what you do. <laughs> Eric, let's get to my conversation with Peter King uh, from NBC Sports. Uh, stopped by Broncos camp earlier this week, had a chance to uh, catch up with him and uh, have a pretty good conversation. So let's get to that now. Peter, it's great to finally do this in person after uh, so many Zooms over the last couple of years. I mean, it's great also to be out. I've been out now eight days and, you know, I've been to six different places. And what I find, I mean, I was at the Raiders and Derek Carr says, Peter, I want to give you a hug. You know, I suppose I shouldn't, but, and he didn't. Um, but I think so many people are so glad that, we can live a little bit like normal, even though obviously there's so much more to go. Well, hopefully uh, this keeps going and uh, the variants calm down a little bit. Uh, I know you had a chance to visit with George Payton, Vic Fangio. What do you think of this Broncos team? Look, I think George Payton has the right attitude. And look, I'm gonna put these words in his mouth, but uh, I think this is really the way he feels, that when he had a chance on draft day, I mean, to me, he made he made a statement on draft day and his statement was, hey, look, if I loved one of these quarterbacks and was convinced they were going to be the franchise quarterback, absolutely convinced we would have picked him. And again, I, I, I mean, that isn't what he told me, but that's the sense that I get. But we have a guy at a crucial position in modern football a top three or four most important position at corner and if you have the ability to get one of those guys and look you're a general manager today you can't just think about who's the best player right now you have to think about in my opinion i think you got to think about an eight-year player you got to think about the second contract if you were drafting a guy ninth overall and you don't think he's going to get a second contract that's a dumb draft choice. You know, you have to be borderline convinced that this guy is going to be a, a cornerstone franchise player for you long term. And that's what I think they're, they are convinced with that in Pat Sertan. The Broncos have been reportedly linked to so many quarterbacks through this offseason. Is there, from a national perspective, a sense that if this team can get some good quarterback play, maybe they'd be pretty good? Well, look, they've got a very good roster. Pro Football Focus said they got the 10th best roster in football. So, look, and I kind of disagree with uh, Pro Football Focus in this regard. I don't think you can have the 10th best roster in football when your quarterback is totally uncertain. And you might have the 29th best quarterback in football or 31st or whatever. And look, I like Drew Locke. I think he definitely should have a chance. I like Teddy Bridgewater too. I think things went south for him early on in Carolina. And let's see if he can get that going again. But obviously there's no sure thing with either of those guys. That's why every quarterback is linked 
to Denver. That's why when I wrote my column, I said, if I had to guess right now, Aaron Rodgers plays in Denver in 2022. But that's all it is. It's a guess. He might play in Green Bay. He might play somewhere else. Who knows? But I think the one thing about this team right now is that, you know, look, a lot of teams, if you don't have a great quarterback, all is lost because you you know you're going to have to score a bunch of points in this league to win. But with this defense, potentially, um, you can win games 21 to 17. And, you know, I think that's what this team's going to need to do. I haven't been in the playoffs for five years now. Uh, I know that the AFC West is very competitive. The AFC overall, very competitive. Do you think, you know, late in December, this team could be in the mix? It, I think it just all depends on Bridgewater slash Lock or Lock slash Bridgewater. They'll be good enough at the other positions. They need quarterbacks to uh, play efficient and make some winning plays. And right now we need to see that. If that happens, there's no question in my mind they can and they probably will make the playoffs. And the last question, every training camp, I know you're making your rounds. Uh, a beer stop, a coffee stop uh, locally here in Denver? I'm going to the Rockies game, and every time I go to the Rockies game, I like to just walk around and weigh my options in beardom, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I will do that. And look, in the past, I've, I'm a big Avery fan. I like the Avery White Rascal. I mean, there's so many beers. This is like beer nirvana. It's, it's just, it's awesome. But you know, the interesting thing about the United States right now, I mean, if you go to Spartanburg, South Carolina, that's got a great beer scene. You say, how, but how can that happen? But almost every place you go right now has got a good beer scene. So yeah, I'm looking forward to something new tonight at, uh, at Coors. Peter, uh, great catching up with you in person. Thanks, Phil, really appreciate it. My thanks to Peter King for uh, spending some time chatting after practice the other day. Eric, he said he was going to the Rockies game and was going to explore the beer options there. I've done that a time or two, Phil. Yes, that's always a, a, a nice way to spend a summer evening out at the ballpark. Uh, pr one of the best ballpark atmospheres, I would say, uh, in all of the majors. Yeah, I would top 30, certainly, I would say. <laughs> it is a good atmosphere, and they the Rockies do draw pretty well. I mean, you even heard yeah. that Fangio talking about that uh, last week. He just said, he, you know, I think they're like sixth in, in the MLB with uh, attendance, which is pretty good for uh, the state of play with the Rockies. Although they're very good at home, you know. They win a lot of home games, so maybe that's why. Is this a baseball podcast? I'm a little confused. Um, no, maybe we should okay. uh, get back to, uh, get back to the Broncos, but, Got it. uh, do you agree with Peter though, uh, before we move on here, where he says, if they get, you know, decent quarterback play, this team's going to be in the playoffs. Yeah. They're, they're certainly gonna be right in the mix. I mean, you talk about the, there's like six teams, I think that are probably competing for three spots because you talk about the the Ravens, Steelers, and Browns. So one of those teams is going to win that division. The other two are going to be competing for a wild card. I think Tennessee is the only team in the AFC South that has a legitimate chance, and so they'll probably win the division now with all the injuries the Colts have. The, you look at the – I was going to say Carson Wentz is set to miss some substantial time here, and, and the Colts' beginning schedule is really tough. It's brutal. Yeah. Yeah. So then you then you look at the AFC East. I think the the Patriots, Bills, and Dolphins all have a chance to to make the playoffs. So you talk about hey, there's two more teams in the wild card hunt, and then I think that the Chargers and Broncos both have a really good chance to be in the wild card hunt. So um, you've got to be better than three of those teams, however it, it plans out. And I think if you get good quarterback play, the way this schedule sets up early, um, the home schedule is very favorable. I think for the most part. There's no reason you can't win 10, 11, 12 games, you know, if you get good quarterback play here. And um, what I've seen from the, the first few days is that, that that quarterback play can be can be good enough. Now, I don't think they're I don't think the Broncos are going to blow a lot of people out, you know, and I think what well, might have been Draymond Jones who mentioned that. 
um, or Shelby Harris, who said Vic Fangio talked to us about, hey, we're going to be playing a lot of one score games. We've got to be really good in these scenarios. So it sounds like they're already kind of preparing to be in these dog fights. Most most NFL games are one score games, yeah. but you know, I, I don't know that the Broncos are going to go out there and like in the days of Peyton, where you just you'd beat somebody by twenty points. I don't think that's going to happen week in and week out. But they certainly should be good enough to to be on the right side of these games. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Let's get to uh, uh, some surprises through camp so far here, Eric. Uh, you know, some names that, you know, we're familiar with, but maybe uh, have caught your eye more than you are expecting. Well, I'll start with two names that everybody knows, but like we mentioned off the top, just how good Jerry Judy's um, has been a little bit of a surprise. He, you know, you expected him to make plays, but Phil, he's, he's having five catches a day and like very limited team reps and is just, so open that you're like who is guarding him like you like sometimes don't even know who's supposed to be responsible for him so he's been a pleasant surprise and I, I think just over the course of the last several days when Cortland Sutton started his first couple of days he looked a little tentative looked a little hesitant wasn't didn't look quite right and I think even over the last couple of days he looks much better and looks like he's getting comfortable and so to me, it's a little bit of a surprise of how quickly that happened, because I thought, you know, maybe we're going to be, it's going to be similar to Bradley Chubb where last year, where, you know, week one, you're still kind of feeling it out. But if he keeps progressing in this, at this rate, he's going to be, you know, a hundred percent by week one, ready to go, making an impact. So just to start off, those are, those are a couple of guys that the way they've performed has surprised me. Yeah, Jerry Judy, I mean, he talked about it during the offseason and said that last year was un unacceptable, and he's been about it in practice. I mean, has he dropped a ball in practice? I mean, I haven't seen it. No, he has yeah. not. And, uh, you know, he's so open. His route running is really crisp. I think that uh, you heard from Drew Locke and Teddy Bridgewater talking about him, and they just – I think they're expecting big things from uh, Jerry this uh, upcoming season. How about a guy like Mike Boone uh, in the backfield? He's been mm. like a little bit more explosive than I uh, I was anticipating, Eric. Yeah, you, you know, I think especially when the pads came on, I thought, hey, he's going to be change of pace guy. You're going to have to, you know, get the ball to him on a screen for him to make an impact. But he's found the holes better than I maybe thought he would. And then when you, I think there was a play Wednesday where, he just had kind of a sliver of daylight and he would have been gone for like probably a 40 yard touchdown and they didn't kind of play it out in real time, but it was an impressive play. He's been good. I, I like Mike Boone. Uh, wow. Vic Fangio likes Mike, likes Mike Boone too. He's, I wouldn't, he, what did Vic say? He said, don't fall asleep on Mike Boone. Yeah. I mean, uh, we obviously knew Melvin Gordon and Javante Williams are going to be the two featured backs, but I do think Mike Boone is going to get some, some touches here in games just because, uh, he he's earned that. I mean, he's just been out there uh, uh, really explosive is the best way I would use to uh, describe him. Uh, Going to be interesting to see what happens after him in the backfield there. You know, uh, Royce Freeman, obviously yeah. there, but uh, other names too, just to see if they keep a fourth guy. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, Levante Bellamy is another option, obviously. Um, do they keep a fullback? Uh, Adam Prentice is an undrafted guy that's kind of been making some plays. You know, he'll probably compete with Andrew Beck. You know, yeah. Andrew's kind of a, a hybrid tight end fullback, so we'll have to see what they do there. But a, a couple other guys, Phil, I think it's been a surprise that Lloyd Cushenberry has just held on. Sir Lloyd Cushenberry the third, the third, please. Thank you. Yes, has just held on to this starting center job with really no competition. I mean, Vic Fangio said early in training camp. Quinn Myers has to prove it should be a competition. And from what I've seen on the not. field yet, Phil, it's not going to happen. I mean, Lloyd is going to be your week one starting center, knock on wood, you know, everybody stays healthy, but he, I mean, he's been better. He's more physical and Quinn is still, he's still developing. Like there, there's a, a, been a bad snap almost every day. So it'll be interesting to see, do they even keep him there? Do they move him to guard? What's, what's kind of the plan with Quinn? Um, but that's been a surprise. Jonathan Cooper has been a pleasant surprise, Phil. Oh, Seventh so you just want to move on from, from Cushionberry. Oh, you, well, you want to talk more about Cushionberry? Go. I oh, love yeah, Cushionberry. Yeah, what Kush. are you talking about? Kush. Yeah. Um, uh, I was going to say that uh, he mentioned that he didn't even take any time off this uh, offseason. Like the season ended and he 
just got to work, Eric, which is, he's probably been reading that Eric Dalala playbook, you know, no exactly. days off. Right. Um, and, you know, he's been working with the likes of like Ben Garland. Okay. We're talking about, you know, former Broncos player here. Uh, Graham Glasgow worked out with him a, a lot this off season. When you look at Cushionberry, he does seem to be a, a little bit stronger, you know, so he said that was uh, probably the biggest thing that he needed to uh, work on was just some of that, the physicality of the NFL game, the mental side of it he had down. So, yeah, as you were, Jonathan Cooper. <laughs> Jonathan Cooper, seventh round pick, didn't do much in the offseason program because he had a, a heart surgery, three of them, ablations, Phil, I believe you pronounce it, to just like the mountain uh, seal up <laughs> exactly the ablation mountains uh no but n- no laughing matter it uh it sounded like if the surgery did not go well he would have needed a pacemaker would have ended his career um and so when you consider that he goes from the operating table in may to doing what he's doing now a bunch of tackles for loss uh, probably based on what i've seen a couple sacks um, i would assume he's going to be a big time special teams contributor He's a guy that I think probably has the lead right now for that fourth outside linebacker spot behind Vaughn Bradley Chubb and Leak Reed. Yeah. And he's just a, you know, he was a big time leader at Ohio state, really a, a guy who sets a tone. And, you know, he said that the word about his heart condition got out just before the draft. You got to wonder maybe if that impacted his uh, stock, you know, dropped all the way to the seventh round for the Broncos who, uh, must have been uh, confident in uh, that surgery and that it was going to get repaired. So uh, they took a, they took a chance on him and uh, hopefully he can stay healthy uh, moving forward here. And yeah, that, that fourth spot, Eric is going to be really interesting at pass rush because uh, we know Von Miller, we know Bradley Chubb, we know Malik Reed, but you need more guys than that in, in the NFL, especially, you know, uh, Vaughn is 32 years old. Bradley Chubb is coming off of a, another injury here. You just need that fourth guy. Uh, last year, it was Jeremiah Tachu. Uh, he's moved on. But, you know, Derek Tuska, you know, J- Jonathan Cooper, g- it's going to be in the mix there, and uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's something I would keep an eye on, too, is after you make these initial roster cuts and waiver guys start being available, it wouldn't surprise me if the if they at least poked around a little bit to see, hey, is there a veteran guy that we could bring in to, because, you know, behind Vaughn and, and Bradley, Malik has a little bit of experience, but he's still a relatively young player. So if there's a if there's a veteran guy, maybe that's an option that, that you think about. Um, pr- probably the last guy that surprised me, Phil, is uh, McTelvin Aguim, third round pick from a year ago. He was somebody that, as we were coming into the season, people were talking about, you know, is he going to be on the roster bubble? Could he be a surprise kind of cut? You know, if because they drafted Marquise Spencer, Shamar Steven comes in, uh, Deshaun Williams has played well, Jonathan Harris back off injury. There's It's just a crowded defensive line room behind the three starters. And so there was no guarantee that a game was even going to make the team. And he, to me, has looked really good. Um, he said he, he really understands the, the mental side of it a little bit better now uh, after a year has a better sense for what he's supposed to be doing. And he's a big body fill and has gotten back there for some tackles for loss, Um, has an interception, a couple batted down passes. I mean, he, he seems like he could be a a solid rotational contributor for this defensive line that, you know, really kind of one of my big concerns going into camp was how untested the depth was behind the three starters. And so for him to show something is a good sign. Eric, it's always amazing to me when you get, there's usually like maybe like three or four players every year. They come out of college. They look like college players. And after one year in the NFL where they're nonstop training in the weight room, eating right in the cafeteria, their bodies just completely transform. And I know that that's, that's part of like, um, the draft evaluation process. It's not so much a, is this guy big enough to play right now, but more of evaluating the guy's frame. Can we put more pounds on this guy's frame and will he be able to still be explosive? I, I think that a game is fit that perfectly where he's really put on and transformed his, his body. 
And uh, of course, in the meeting rooms with Bill Kolar, he's going to get you right. So the combination of transforming his body plus Kolar's coaching, yeah, I'm ready for him uh, really to uh, get some playing time here. A, a guy similar to that was like Draymond Jones when he came out and he set, he set up now to be really a breakout player for the Broncos. So yeah, a game has, has uh, definitely looked much different. So that's those all are, I got, Phil. Those are my those guys. Are your surprises. Yeah, I, I agree. Nothing yeah. like uh, I agree that a game has really uh, uh, stepped up there, but the defense is pretty much, you knew what you were getting here. I mean, like that with the ones yeah. that's all been, that's all been hammered in and there haven't, haven't been really many, whoa moments from the defense you just you sort of know what you're going to get there so um right. Trinity Benson on the offensive side has been pretty good too I think he's made some plays where in the past he's just kind of been like a rep guy out there just you know to uh ha have a camp body but he's actually made some plays and I think that uh um he should be in the mix there at the back end of that wide receiver room so. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see. Obviously, Tyree Cleveland, as we're recording this, has missed the last few practices with a, a bruised backside. He's got to get back out there and compete. Uh, Seth Williams in the mix, Kendall Hinton, uh, like you mentioned, Trinity Benson. Those those four guys, I would say, are probably like the, the four that are really in the mix there. And, and maybe like Kendall, just a notch below those other three, if I if I were just guessing. Um and but, Seth Williams, you know, a rookie I'm, coming in, he's got to really learn the playbook. He's got to know what he's doing out there. And that's sort of the challenge for him. I'm always just a little wary, Phil, of these guys that dominate against like the second and third team defense. Of course. And because um, that's what, you know, like I'm, there's a preseason darling every year. You know, yeah. like I feel like Capri Bibbs was that guy at one point. Like uh, Austin Fort was that guy a couple years ago before he got hurt. So just it's different when you do it against the ones and when you get in there. So, um, yes, I remember last year, Phil, they put Isang Bassi in with the ones just out of nowhere during practice to see if he could do it. And he did it. And that, well, that was kind of the moment you actually knew, hey, this guy's got a chance to, to make the team. But until you see, you know, Trinity Benson catching a pass over Ronald Darby or something like that, I would just be a little... I would pump the brakes just a little. I don't think Not to say what he's done. Go out there and take the league by storm, but but he could be a guy well, who was just a complete afterthought maybe a year ago. He he could sneak in there and get some special teams time and 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 make yeah, this roster. No, I'm not. You know, not uh, not you. There, some of the media members out there during practice. It's like some of these training camp stars are like the second coming of Hall of Fame players, and it's just like take it easy a little bit. You you like to pump the brakes a little bit on that. that yeah, I like to see it. Yeah, me too. Let's get the narrative on the right on the right path. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm gonna be late. Like Trinity surprise. Benson. I'm gonna Trinity Benson hater. Yeah, you are. Sometimes you identify guys and you just hate them no matter what. Isn't that right? <laughs> yes, of course. That's what the commenters tell me. And you hold grudges, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what it's very like personal. Are, well, to me. Everything's everything's personal. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Last, uh, last segment here on this episode, Eric, let's talk about the hall of fame where Trinity Benson will be heading in a, a 10 to 12 years here. Um, Eric, Steve Atwater, John Lynch, Peyton Manning. This is a Broncos weekend. If I've ever seen one, uh, there should be a lot of orange and blue in Canton. You and me, we're both going to be there, and it's going to be crazy. Yeah, I, I truly do not know what to expect. It's you know we've heard that Brett Favre's uh, enshrinement ceremony, which was what back in 2012, 2013, something like that. Well, he, he came back out of retirement so many times; it's hard to sort of. Yeah, I think 08 was maybe his last year. 09, I don't know. But it was not it was five, six years ago, seven years ago. That was like the, the most people they'd ever had there. And this is, they've said that this is just going to be way beyond that. You've got, I think, 21 or 22 guys going in over the weekend. It's just going to be absolute pandemonium, Phil. I, we're going to have to like have a little walkie talkie so we can communicate in case yeah. we get separated. Hopefully, uh, 
like the cell phone towers won't just be just overrun by the masses. Right. You no. Know, otherwise we'll be just trapped there. Yeah. We'll never be back. Yeah. But, but it should you know, be a nice I, weekend. I mean, I think that I'm looking forward to some of these. Obviously, Steve Atwater is a, a dear friend to us. And to be able to see him put on that gold jacket is going to be a special, special moment. Uh, for John Lynch, he's been a finalist so many times, finally across uh, the threshold. Uh, that's going to be really cool. And I think, obviously, Peyton Manning. Uh, we know that Peyton Manning has a personality where he can really hold court and his Hall of Fame speech, while it's being limited to, uh, what is it, eight minutes or something? I mean, it's going to be a great eight minutes. The pressure is on, Eric. I mean, you think he's feeling yeah. some pressure, man? Like people are saying, they're looking forward to this speech. He better deliver. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's why I always under-promise, over-deliver. You don't want to have expectations too high or it's hard to live up to them, but... Yeah. No, I think Peyton will be great. And maybe if some other, maybe they could just give him a couple more eight minute segments. I would listen to Peyton talk for, you talk about some of these guys going on for like 40 minutes and it's just, yeah. it kind of drags on. Yeah. I would listen to Peyton talk for 40 minutes. No yeah. question. He, it would be hilarious. Probably some great stories in there. Um, yes. Maybe he'll just speak really fast. That could, that could be a good could way be. to get by it. Could be. But yeah. no, I, I'm, I'm excited for him and, and for Steve just, the fact that he's had to wait so long since being elected back in February of 2020. I mean, this is a long time coming. It had it disappointing to have the first enshrinement be canceled. And so to finally get to go in, I know he's excited for that. It'll be cool to, to celebrate with him. Most definitely. Uh, I think that it's just going to be sort of a, uh, like, uh, sometimes I get a little overwhelmed you know, with some of the emotion where I'm like, I wasn't expecting it, but there's something about that gold jacket dinner when they put that that thing on, the nostalgia effect is just like overwhelming sometimes. You know, uh, a lot of people like even say with this podcast, like you bring the analytical part, I bring the emotional part. I, yep. I am just like, uh, I'm overwhelmed when I'm at the Hall of Fame sometimes. Yeah, I think I think well, it's a, it's a really a cool situation. A lot of the Broncos Hall of Famers are expected to uh, be in Canton. I think what Shannon Sharp's the only guy who, at least right now, is scheduled not to be there. Or? That's right. Yeah, and I think somebody said on Twitter that he might have had surgery and is recovering from that or something. I saw a picture of him. And, uh, yeah, he. I think he was getting some work done. So, um, so but yeah, I think John make- Elway, Gary Zimmerman, Terrell Davis. All Shannon to, Sharp, I know, he'll like probably jump out of an Champ airplane. Bailey. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it should be cool. I, I really enjoy the Hall of Fame uh, weekend. Of course, it's going to be two nights. You know, uh, Saturday night uh, is the 2020 class. Steve. Which is Steve. And then Sunday, uh, the 2021 class. So, Pete Manning and John Lynch. Yeah. Uh, Eric, you know, a lot of people are sometimes can get a little confused about the Hall of Fame. Is Peyton Manning going in as a Bronco? Is he going in as a Colt? Can you uh, clear this up for uh, some of the listeners out there? Yeah, he's going in as a Bronco. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's right. You're welcome. That, that's because he likes the Broncos more than the Colts, right? That's true. Yeah. Is that Broncos practice on Wednesday? He was. When is the last time no, no. he took in a Colts practice? Yeah, people are asking that. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, he, uh, you don't do that in the NFL, Phil. You don't, it's not like baseball where you choose a little cap. You just, uh, you go in as yourself, as the individual. And that's going to be important, I think, especially as we get, you know, more into this free agency era. Like guys just don't play their whole careers with one team anymore. So it wouldn't make sense to do it that way anyway. But I will say, like, uh, uh, for, for John Lynch, too, and Peyton Manning, they've always made it a point to, whenever they're talking about their career, include both, you know, like, yeah. uh, uh, or when you show, like, a highlight tape of these guys, you got to show a little bit of both, because I do think that it's important that, like, you acknowledge these fan bases, because, like, of course, all of the Colts fans out there, they're like, this is our guy. 
all the Broncos yeah. fans are like, no, he finished his career in Denver. You guys kicked him to the curb. We took him in. He won a Super Bowl and rode off into the sunset. So, like, I think it's natural for fan bases to sort of want to take ownership, you know. Yeah. And even with John Lynch, you know, like, uh, uh, he lived in Denver for a long time after his career. And, like, people are sort of, like, try to take ownership. So, I think that's a natural part of f- fandom, you know. But uh, I've noticed that both of those guys really make it a point to acknowledge their entire career. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So hopefully we'll catch up with those guys and be able to, uh, I don't know, uh, b- bring some great content to uh, Broncos country. It's always the goal. We'll see. We'll see what happens. All right, Eric, let's wrap things up. Uh, any shout outs? Uh, shout out Liz Gerald's. Yeah. Parentheses. Wait. Man is, yeah. Can, can some be. great, great community work. Uh, I believe some players went over to our local King Supers. That's where I buy my coffee, Eric. Yeah, gold package, elephant on the front. West, um, not a sponsor, yeah. but could be if they wanted to be. Yeah, um, King Supers definitely a sponsor of the Broncos. Not of yet the of the neutral zone, but not of the neutral soon. zone. Um, but they did a little, little back to school shopping spree, got some kids who maybe wouldn't be able to get their own school supplies, hooked them up. So nice, uh, Phil, I'm sure you, you went there, you got your new little backpack, you got your colored pencils. Was that one of your favorite things back in the day? Uh, back to school is like a big deal because like you show up, maybe you're lucky enough to get some like new shoes or something before. Yeah. And then you like show up and you're like, how was your summer? look at what i look at what i got going on here maybe you got a new a new binder you know yeah with a zip you know and you decorated the outside of it yeah 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 and all the other kids are like oh dang look at phil milani look at his trapper you know that's what that's another word that that was used trapper yeah i don't know that that's like a big binder you know like that's a big binder yeah mine was like decked out with like broncos and nuggets stickers and i was just oh wow it was kind of a big deal back in the day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know how it is. Uh, yeah, shout out to the community. That's a great, <clears throat> that's a great thing because back to school can be hard for for a lot of families yeah. out there. You know, it can it's get expensive. really expensive. Yeah, those like TI eighty three calculators. Oh my gosh, forget about it. That's what you use to play games. You know, in, in math class. You know, that's what yeah. You do. So, yeah. Yeah. That, that that can get expensive. So. Yeah, shout out, shout out to the community department. I think that's a, I think that might be it. I did know you know Emily Zaylor, uh, uh, the Broncos strength coach. Yeah, I uh, do the know community that de- department sent like a care package to her mom, who is battling leukemia for the third time, uh, and uh, the Broncos community department sent out a nice little care package. Uh, I thought that was that was pretty cool too. Yeah. Uh, shout out to Gertie, 109 years old, oldest living Broncos fan. Gertie. Apparently. We don't, um, it's like a little, we're not sure, but we think. 109, probably, I would think that that's probably. You probably think that that's. Just go ahead and call it. Yeah, that that's yeah. the oldest. And then um, maybe one one more shout out, Phil, former friend of the podcast, former intern extraordinaire, Emily Samanskis. Yes, uh, she, uh, maybe NZ Nation might know her for the famous "Hello." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, moving to Chicago to join the Blackhawks yeah. social media team. Very exciting. Congratulations, Emily. Yes, uh, leaving leaving Wyoming, but still probably a member of Broncos country. I would think most definitely, most definitely. Yeah. I don't think she'll become a Bears fan. Although, better not. What ha- what's going to happen when the Blackhawks play the Habs, Eric? Oh. Yeah, kind of. I don't know. The Blackhawks aren't very. They're not very good right now, are they? The Blackhawks. Yeah. Um, they're not as good as the Avs. No, but um, the Avs are going for cups. You know, that's they're they're in their window. You know, I would say. Yeah, the window is. So, they've underperformed. Nathan, Mc, Nathan in the McKinnon playoffs, is so grumpy. Too. Yeah, they've underperformed a little bit, but uh, they're gearing up. I think that they're the odds on favorite for next year. So. Well. Lock it in then. I I don't know, I don't know if you're keeping track at home, but I've managed to squeak in Rockies, Nuggets, and Avs all in this Broncos podcast. Yeah, in rapid fashion. 
I like it. Yeah, you gotta be pretty. You gotta be pretty sharp to pay attention in this podcast. Rapid. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's wrap things up here, Erica. We talked about the quarterback situation for the first two hours of this episode, and then uh, heard from Peter King from NBC Sports. Uh, some interesting uh, takes there in that conversation. Our biggest surprises of training camp so far, Trinity Benson heading to the Hall of Fame. That was probably our biggest surprise so far. And then uh, we previewed what to expect this weekend uh, in Canton, Ohio, as three members of the Broncos get enshrined into football immortality. Uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be a special weekend there. Eric, how would you do your bust? How would you, would you look grumpy or would you smile? Oh, I always look grumpy. So I'd probably yeah. go with that. Yeah. That's what I, that's what I figured. Yeah. yeah. Just sort of a big frown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, the eeyore of the yeah. hall of fame busts probably yeah and if there was like a plaque underneath it would just say take that haters yeah exactly yeah, yeah. so all right we'll be back next week but until then for eric the law i'm phil milani you've been listening to the neutral zone